Here we are, Podcast World, back at you. As we promised, we got part two of our Mountain Ops series with owner, co-founder, Mr. Jordan Harvinson, who I just watched him put on a Mountain Ops hat. I think that he was feeling a little guilty of me wearing all this branding all the time. And today's episode of the podcast, again, is brought to you by our friends out of the great state of Oregon, Gerber Gear, Stay Sharp America. You know how myself and our crew feels about knives and always being ready whether it's building a blind with a saw, needing a hatchet to cut some legs off. My brothers killed a big old 350-inch bull elk last night in the state of Nevada, and they used all kinds of Gerber tools to get the hindquarters out of the canyon that he decided to run down into before he perished. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends out of another great state in the West United States, Utah, Mountain Ops. If you want to live the life, you can't just talk about it. You got to wake up and you got to do it. You got to commit to it. You got to stay consistent and and that's what the mountain ops culture teaches you. There's no judging. There's nobody that's going to be body shamed ever in the mountain ops family. As a matter of fact, I've seen a lot of outdoorsmen that don't look like they're in shape that will whip my butt and climb in a mountain, just like we touched on here last time. So today is part two of the mountain ops series of becoming a better version of ourselves. And my guest again is co-founder, co-owner, Mr. Jordan Harbertson. What's up, my brother? What's going on, Chad? Quite the introduction, as always. Always impressed that you can hold your breath and say that all in one, one breath. breath. That's what goose calling teaches you. Don't you do that on an elk bugle or something? Yeah, same thing. You know, like you're just trying to just hold that in and then just let yeah. it rip. You know, you just kind of prolong that call. But you guys, you guys duck call and you guys do more of that like rapid fire. Like you're like. Mag, 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 mag. I had a, had a bunch of them fly over the house yesterday. They weren't really in a V. It was just kind of like lopsided. There was one a geese that was on this side, and then there were the rest of them were all on one. I was like, man, that looks more like a check mark than it does a V. Do you know, do you, do you know but, why that uh, side's longer? Why is this? It, why is that? There, Tell, help, yeah, there's more geese you. on that side. <laughs> that's we'll that's about all yes. I know about duck and goose hunting. Yeah, and the kids and I were actually the other night, we were watching, uh, we just got like a, a random, I can't even remember how it hit me, but all of a sudden I, I looked at my son, I said, do you guys want to watch Mighty Ducks? And they're like, what's that, dad? I was like, all right, we're, we're watching all three. So we've, we've now watched all three Mighty Ducks. My son's like, dad, like, I'm going to play hockey now. I'm going to do the flying V. And I was like, I remember how much that movie impacted me oh, as yeah. a kid. Not only because my love for sports, but just like the camaraderie that's there with like your teammates and like these guys that were defeating the, you know, the odds of this. I think let's see in, in the first one, it was the Hawks they were playing, which is the coach's old team. And then in D2, they, they were the USA trying to beat Nor Norway or whatever. And yeah, I, I so again, ducks, you know, like let's go. Yeah, ducks. the Emilio Estevez, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and when I honestly, I don't know if you remember this, this is going to be kind of a, you know, we're kind of getting a little over on this side, but do you, did you ever watch Night of the Roxbury? I don't know. I've seen so many highlights of it. I feel like I have, but I don't know if I've ever sat down and watched it in its entirety. There's this one scene where I didn't even realize it until um, later when my wife and I rewatched it when he's in line about to get in the club and he's bragging about how he met this dude. He's like, I met him, Emilio Estevez, mighty duck man, I swear to God. And uh, I, for so long, it, like when I had watched that show, I never realized that that was Coach Bombay that he was talking about, that he had actually like met him and was bragging about it. And I was like, who is this mighty duck guy that he's talking about? That's Emilio Estevez. Right so now. you learn that later on after seeing the movie a few times. Yeah, just like I learned that if the ducks are flying in somewhat of a check mark instead of a V, it's because there's just more Yeah, that's all that I could think. Like. A lot of people are like, well, it's aerodynamics. They get more speed. They get more, you know, there's more drift like that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, they're just, leaning, they're just leaning into the wind, right? They're trying to, they're leaning in. So like if the V is perfect, it's because there's a straight, straight on wind and they're just cutting yeah. through it. But that wind's yeah. coming from the Southeast. They're like, all right, let's adjust you guys. Come on this side. Let's cut that wind I together. I wonder if they are you know? that smart. They got to be. I mean, they migrate thousands and thousands of miles. They do. They do. And, you know, the ones that are smart, obviously, <clears throat> they're not the ones that end up in piles. But 
for all the rest of them, they tend to live long lives and, you know, stick around. You, you for talk a while. about piles, Jordan. You've been threatening for three, going on three years now about doing a duck and goose hunt with me, and we still haven't done the mountain ops hunt. We need to. We need to because I told you this three years ago. I, I well, even four years ago, I never got into duck hunting. I, I just always said, I'm just going to go hunt big game. Like, I don't really understand why somebody wants to go out and sit in the cold and shoot ducks, right? Then I experienced it for myself and everything changed. And I was like, you know what? Anytime I get an invite or if I could go out or if I can invite somebody, I want to go because duck hunting is so fun. If you're on the edge and they're actually coming in and it's, and it's kind of continuous, it's fun. If it's not, those moments are kind of like whitetail hunting to me where they're spread out. But the moment that they come in, they commit and you're like, dude, they're coming into the decoys. They're going to hit land. Like, let's take them, you know, give them three. Let's cut them. It's like, it's the funnest thing, but you can sit there all day with your buddies and have a good time. And you can, you can talk and kind of like have a conversation like you and I are. And then all of a sudden, once, you know, you see like a, a bunch of them out there or flock or whatever, you're like, all right, guys, like settle down, quiet guns at the ready. Let's see what happens. And then the calls start coming out and yeah, I'm not a good caller, but I, I like hunting with guys. That yeah. Do, they, you know, they, so, um, you don't have to be a good, good caller to do it. I think calling is one of those aspects of hunting that just adds to it when you feel the the vocabulary and that like that diction and that conversing with the wild animal. Like if you were strong enough to be, you know, to 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 cow call or bugle in a bull elk or to call a predator or to gobble a turkey or to hen call a turkey there's so much cool things in mother nature to where you can communicate with wild animals and if you really break down the science of it of what you're trying to say again it's like that theory of well do they really understand the, their v's and their aerodynamics and how to fly i don't know if like we as humans have come up with this ideology or this this description of these sounds we're making into these calls well that's me saying um i'm challenging that coyote or that's me saying i'm a female and i'm inviting that coyote to come in to where i'm at to mate with me i mean if you think about it I don't know if there's scientific research that can actually be proven that that sound I just made on that call replicates this exactly, but there are sounds that you can prove out there. I think of what an animal is saying, but they're always like a rabbit dying. Like I've heard a rabbit dying, right? And you can replicate that sound and a coyote will come to it. But I don't know if we fully understand a full vocabulary of an animal quarry or an animal population does that make sense like do we really know what a cow elk is saying when she does her thing on the mountainside do you do you do you kind of grasp what i'm trying to lay down here totally and i think there's there's masters of trade right so i think like for the average guy like me where i can grab a duck call and i can i can blow into that i can sound what i think is a duck and and i think it's enough to your point that I can, I can really deceive them and get them to come in or commit to some decoys and say, Oh, there's a bunch of ducks in here. Like, let's see what's going on. Like, I want to, I want to hold up for a second, you know? And on the, on the elk side, same thing. Like I, I would call myself again, a very novice caller. I I've called elk in, I've called bulls in, I've had experiences. I've called cows in, like I've sounded like what I think is a cow. Now there's all, like you said, there's degrees in which like there's an estrus call where you sound like more hot and more attractive or, me, like where you sound like you're more, I don't know if I sound like I'm a tough bull or, or a pansy bull, but enough, I get enough, I get a reaction or I get a response and then they start coming in because they're curious, right? Most of the time, I think there's a lot of curiosity, but then you talk about somebody like Corey Jacobson, who's obviously a master caller, like the guy really understands, just like you for duck hunting, he's like the, the elk hunting caller that just he has so many different sequences that he uses uh, to make it sound like either he's a big herd of elk or that he's, you know, an elk that's in heat um, or that he's a big bull. And then he understands like he's the challenge like with elk and he's kind of learned and studied them so much to figure out that, hey, if I cut him off when he's in mid bugle, that actually upsets him and makes him almost more agitated to say, I'm going to come and like beat the crap out of you because I'm trying to talk to you right? And you're cutting me off. And I think that's natural in communication like you and I, like we can talk. And if I was to cut you off enough, you'd be like, dude, Jordan, bro, like let's have a conversation. You're kind of making me mad because I'm not allowed. But on the other side of it, couldn't I just be like, you know what? Jordan's a know-it-all. I'm out of here. I'm going to go find somebody that really wants to rap with me. 
Yeah, and, and touche. There's there's times where the bull never shows up, and guys are like, "Dude, I did exactly what you told me, and it didn't happen the way you said." And it's like, dude, you can't put a perfect scenario on any situation to say that it's going to always happen that way because it's nature. It's unpredictable. But I think the fact that we have the ability to communicate with them at a level where we as hunters can deceive them and get them to come in and, and create you know close proximity and opportunity. I think it's I really agree. cool. But yeah, I, I would never say, I would never, I hope anybody listening to this podcast, you're never going to find me on the stage competing at an elk calling competition. I, tr- I did that once at our mountain ops elk calling competition at the, the Western Hunting Expo and everybody laughed. And, but I, I made sure to let everybody know, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there, but I'm going to let the pros get up there yeah, and do their that's, job. That's like hosting you a karaoke know? show, right? You just get up there and do it just just because you're the host of it. You have to get up there. But here, yeah. here's an analogy for you. And think about this. When you're calling Canada geese, and there's so many words and sounds that a Canada goose and then a flock of Canada geese make. And then you have all the subspecies of Canada geese, which is upwards of 11 to 14. Some people say you hunt the state of Oregon. You need to take a special test, Jordan, to make sure that you can identify a cackler, an Aleutian, a Taverner, a Western, a greater, all of these different subspecies of this Canada goose population. So when I'm calling Canada geese, I have a short read goose call and I'm saying things to them that some people might be like, well, they're birds of a feather. They flock together. They're not greedy. They're not stingy. They all look alike. They all love being together. When you see them on the ground, they're all just picking at the ground and got their wings up saying hello to each other. Geese, in my opinion, do not like each other. So when I call geese, now some people might look at me and go, well, you're nuts for saying this, but I always call geese with kind of the Michael Jackson thriller video analogy of like, we're, we're two gangs and my gang is on our turf down here. And you're coming in off of this place where you just woke up swimming all night and eating and sitting on the water on your roost. And now you think you're going to come into my alfalfa field, my pea field, my bean field, my corn field, whatever it is. Well, I got news for you. So I talk smack in my head. I'm painting this picture of this gang war going on and i'm like yeah come in here and i'm gonna whip you stay out of here so they're coming in and they hear that and they're like and i start getting a little bit more like bring it bro bring it come on man come on so then they turn around and they start to leave when some people would be like well they're leaving because you made the wrong noise and you need to give them a comeback call. I say, no, they're leaving because I told them that I needed this. So I talk smack louder. Like, that's what I thought. Go home and tell your mama what I just said. That kind of stuff, right? So then so then that lead goose in the flying pack goes, wait a minute. I ain't backing down from this dude anymore. He said too much. So then they turn around. Then they come back, put their landing gear down, their feet, cup their wings, and they start to land because they're ready to fight. So my point is this. I'm not saying that. I'm 100% right, but nobody could ever really tell me, are you 100% wrong that I'm acting like it's a gang fight and I'm not sitting there going, hey guys, the food's great down here. Come and eat all the food that I've sat on all morning trying to warm up this earth with my body heat to pick the frost and the ice away from it to get some nutrients in my belly because I almost starved to death last night and almost got eaten by a coyote that I had to get away from because there was so much ice they were there was thick enough for the coyote to run on. All of this stuff is going through my head as a goose hunter when I'm trying to paint that picture to those geese in the air so that was what i was talking about is that it's not always like well just come on down here the water's fine jump in it's more like no man this is my area y'all get the heck out of here we'll fight if you come down here and that that challenge i think oftentimes you you find the alpha in the group right what you pick out the alpha and with that challenge they're 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 the alpha so they're like you're not going to challenge me i'm going to either take care of you or i'm going to show you you know, and that I think that goes for for all animals. I mean, every single animal, whether they're a packed animal, like you're speaking to, like um, like the flock of of ducks or geese or or a herd of elk. I mean, you're gonna have that herd bull, or you're gonna have that that big buck, or you're gonna have. I mean, there's those animals that just recognize within the uh, the pecking order that they are the elite, they are the upper echelon, they are the right. alpha. And if anybody challenges that, like you said, in the game, like, like, like you're talking smack to them, dude, they're, they're not going to, they might, like you said, they might go away for a second, but they're going to come back. But here's, here's something for you. So I think this is just kind of a segue, but um, again, like one of the things that, that I love, and we talked about kind of in part one um, that I love that you kind of brought up was just kind of like how ducks are, right? How they act. They're, they're a flock that, that, that they're birds of a feather that fly together, that they're, they're all about like helping each other out, being together. Um, and that is so 
as, as cliche as it may sound, that is exactly what it's like at Mountain Ops. Not only just inside our office, um, we've got a lot of incredible uh, employees and incredible team members a part of Mountain Ops on the internal team. But that, that goes from ripple effects outside of that building to our core, I would say, community that we've developed uh, at Mountain Ops, which is you would love, we talked about this last time, just to see the people that are helping one another, that are looking out for each other, people who have never met each other other than through online or through Mountain Ops's, you know, means it's really, it's really incredible. And it's in, and in many ways, it's incredibly humbling to see the, the amount of people in Mountain Ops that are like a flock of birds that, that fly together, if you will. And it's, it's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I think it's a great segue as far as um, the community and the culture of something that can take somebody like, you know, you have superstars on the team, right, that are considered – celebrity quote unquote you got your Haynes and you got your Mendez you got guys that have thousands of people that'll line up to get an autograph you have guys like Mendez that have fought Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo and been in the limelight of the USC UFC and before that the WEC and he's had his hand raised by Big John and he knows he knows Buffer I mean these guys are legitimate people and they're on the same playing level as everybody else in this Mountain Ops community meaning that that Frank over in New Jersey that has that orange shield decal on his truck can get a hold of Chad Mendez and get his opinion on whether it's a supplement, whether it's a workout routine, whether it's a fitness question or a nutrition question. That's what I love about the outdoors is that it almost humbles you to the point to where mother nature and God are the way up here and everything that happens within the, the doors of mountain ops. The flooded timber of Arkansas, the Elk Mountains of Colorado, or you're chasing a moose in, in, in the Northwest Territories. All of that stuff is so humbling and brings us to our knees that it takes the ego out of it and that there's almost no room for it to where in hunting, it's easy to say, all right, people are in it for some different reasons, right? Some people want a 400 inch bull. Some people want a meat bull. Some people want 180 inch white tail. Some people like a 130. Um, I... I've always looked at it like, where is there room for ego in hunting? If you're really doing it for the right reasons, if you're really part of the mountain ops culture, it's kind of a filter of exactly what hunting and the culture of the outdoorsman should mean to so many people. And I think that with companies and brands like what you and Trevor and your brother have built at mountain ops, it's going to give people the ability to see, whoa, there's no room for ego. If Chad Mendez is this humble after everything that he's accomplished, after everybody he's beat up or gotten beat up by everything that he's done of signing autographs and huge endorsement deals and all of these TV deals, and he can laugh and joke with you like you're his brother from another mother or sister from another mister, then we have really no reason to ever go, I'm the best hunter in the world. You can't blow a duck calling me. I'm the best archery hunter in the world because I do this with my, no, if you meet these guys, Guys that are the cream of the crop, the Waddells or the Cameron Haynes, who's killed more bull elk with his bow than most people will ever see. They never, ever put themselves above the animal or mother nature or the Lord above that gives us this idea and this blessing and this privilege, Jordan, to be an American hunter. And I think that that's what's so cool about the mountain ops culture is that we can reach out to people that in, in 10 years ago, we'd have been like, there's no way I could reach out to a professional athlete. He's on a different level. They're really not. They're just human beings that mix their ammo the same way that we do. And that's kind of like what the culture all means to myself. I 100% agree. And I think it even goes back to the way we were talking earlier about how we're trying to communicate with animals as hunters, right? And the different ways that we do that. And I think that that language or that way in which you speak to others becomes self-evident in the kind of groups that you associate yourself with or the, or the kind of people that you bring to you, right? So the same way that you're going to challenge a duck uh, for the purpose of that you want to, you want to really challenge them to say, hey, I'm the big dog here. And then you're trying to get him. There's a purpose for that, right? But at Mountain Ops, that's that's not how we we communicate with people. That's not not our purpose or or really our why, right? And our company's always been our, our why is in everything we do, we improve the lives of individuals and families by inspiring them to achieve their ultimate level of performance. You know, through the highest quality of our our energy and nutritional products, 
backed by science and a community, again, that's been created to unite and educate uh, individuals to learn how to train inside and conquer outside. Again, taking complete advantage of the beautiful nature and this God-given earth that we have and the ability as hunters that we have to be stewards over it. And so how we as a brand, how we as a, as a, as a team internally communicate outwardly to anybody within the outdoor space or anybody who's maybe not even, maybe not endemics, maybe people who aren't hunters, what I have continued to find and the way that, that Casey and I set this up and, and how our team embraced it. And now they're the stewards, I believe over our brand more than anything now is that they one they recognize God. Right. And I think that's really important in mountain ops. That's our number one core value and belief. And, and then from there on, you can read everything about our company and that's who we've, that's how we've spoken. That's the way that we've tried to, to call out or communicate to the community and say, Hey, do you guys want to come be a part of this brand experience, be part of this company, try these products and, and help improve your life or your friends or your families? And it's been so, again, humbling to see over the last six years where that's gone and the community that's formed because of the core foundational beliefs and values that we have held so true to, and to, to us as, as Mountain Ops and as founders that now have been embraced by our team members who we, we consider family members. I mean, we talk about the Mountain Ops family because that's what we are. We're a family that looks out for each other. We're, we're considerate of one another. We're trying to better each other. You said removing ego. I think ego is the enemy, the enemy of everything you have and anything you want. And every day we're trying to check our egos. We all have them. But yes, at Mountain Ops, we don't, we don't have in the, if you want to call the ranks of Mountain Ops or within the membership or our family, it, it, it doesn't, our culture at Mountain Ops, our brand, <clears throat> our values, our beliefs do not, are not attractive to people who have big egos, to people who are very negative, to people who are demeaning to others, to people who want to be selfish. Like we're a very selfless company. We, we believe more in interdependence rather than we do like making somebody feel that they can't accomplish something or that because like you said earlier, they're not a pro or you can't do that. I mean, there's just no room for that at Mount Ops. And we love that. I, I wish those individuals the best. And I hope that they can find, if that's their happiness, great. That's not ours. But we, we want to inspire others. We want to motivate others. We want to embrace others and help them to achieve things. Or as we always say, conquer more of things that they never thought were possible that are possible if they believe in themselves. And so by being part of a community that, that believes that and encourages that and really lives that, like you always talk about living the brand, you see people's lives changing every day, whether it's losing weight, increasing their mental health, uh, being able to go out and go farther and stay longer and, and being able to see that through diet, dieting, through supplementation, through exercise, through being active, through reading and, and exercising your mind and becoming more spiritual all these things combined into a very happy, fulfilling life. And why wouldn't you want that, Chad? Like, why? You know what I mean? Like, doesn't that sound good? I think it, I, like, give me a I think it sounds it. amazing. But here's a question to you on the on the advocacy side, or the 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 you know who's advocate, the devil's advocate. I'm going to play for a second, Jordan Harbertson. We live we live in a country that is obese we live in a country that is out of shape as a whole we live in a country to where we have diet fads that have taken over the country for times medications uh meal planning all of the things that you hear the word diet and i automatically think well okay well what's this one i can't ever eat a piece of noodle again because i'm italian and i like a good lasagna once in a while my mom's italian don't judge me on my last name my dad rest in peace i used to tell pops dad i'm gonna change my last name to mom's last name because i want to be known as an italian and he'd get all like, pissed off at me. You know, he'd say, just put an O at the end of Belding, but Beldingo doesn't sound very good, Jordan. My point is, Jordan, diets are a fad. You could go through life and be like, well, I'm never going to eat a carb again, like Atkins said. Well, that's not really healthy because I feel like I get dumber. When I, when I try to talk or I try to be a little bit intelligent, I don't think that my brain works the way when I'm not eating any carbs. I'm not saying that I need to stuff myself on starches all the time. I know that there's a give and take and a balance. But in our country, Jordan Harbertson, it seems to me like everybody's looking for that instant gratification, that quick result. 
my question to you is when you say things like who wouldn't want that lifestyle, I look at people without passing judgment. I look at it almost, and I don't want to say that it's almost like on a high horse or in a, in a sad way. But when you look at somebody that's so out of shape that, you know, they can't really enjoy bending over and tying their shoes or even standing up off of a couch or getting out of their automobile, Jordan, I've seen it to where people have to put their hand here and then grasp onto this and then pull. There's no way that that feels good. My question to you is, do you ever look at people like that and say, why can't you get started? Why is it so hard to get started? But then why is it so hard to keep going, Jordan? What does it take inside our inner psyche to say enough is enough? I don't need to never tell. I don't need to tell myself I'm going to punish myself for the rest of my life and never eat a piece of French bread with butter and garlic spread on it. What can we tell these people, Jordan, as, the, as a guy that lives this lifestyle every day? How do we get started? We're not judging you, but I just feel like everybody wants to feel what you just described. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody wants to go through life unhealthy, not being able to keep up with their kids, not being able to feel, you know, be pain free with their ligaments, their tendons, their joints. I know I'm rambling on, Jordan, but I'm really passionate about this. I don't want to see our country out of shape. I don't think that it feels good. How do you get started? And I think the, the, the thing that everybody needs to recognize first is that, right, with looking at oneself, right? Because it's easy for others to tell you what to do or to try and design your life for you or say, this is how you can be happy, right? There's, but at the end of the day, it, it's an, an individual decision. And that decision really is based in habits. So the question you're asking of like, how does a person that, you know, is so out of shape or doesn't feel good, like, how do they even get started? Or how, do they, how do they obtain this lifestyle? Well, it's all incremental right? They got to where they are right now if it's somebody who's not healthy and not happy because of bad habits, period. Habits are everything. If you want to be able to live a happy, more meaningful life, it's a basis of you recognizing and prioritizing your habits and understanding when you what bad habits you have and how to correct those. And let me tell you, to develop a new habit is much easier than to eliminate a bad one. Because the bad one has been around for so long and it's become so, it's, it's so normal for you. It's, 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 it's routine, right? And you don't even think about it. You, you eat that food or you eat that because that's just what you do. If you mentally are, are depressed or stressed, chemicals are released in the body that how you, in, in an instance, have a bell ring. I need chocolate or I need ice cream or I need food or I need these things because when I get that sugar release, it makes me feel good. Right. But that's a bad habit because you shouldn't have to take or eat things or, or food to make you feel good. Um, there's ways that you can develop habits. Now, the thing that everyone needs to, to recognize first and foremost is it can take anywhere from studies show anywhere from 18 to 254 days for a, a single person to form a new habit. OK, but on average, so the average individual is about 66 days for a new habit to become automatic. So when you move it from the column of trying to make it a habit into it becomes automatic and now it's part of your, your routine. And moving it from that from, from beginning to end is a process and it takes time. And so I think when you say that the question, some people can't even get started or when they do, they get burned out. It's because they're either not pacing themselves or they're not, they're not being mindful of the journey that it's not a matter of just like getting it done right now because everybody wants to fix something quick. Like you said, everybody wants the fast food model, the, the quick and easy. Like, how do I get to, you know, the same way they want to make money? How do I make a million dollars the fastest way? It's like, guys, I'm sorry, but the only path forward is in an incremental path of, of recognizing the bad habits you have. Once you recognize those bad habits, addressing them by putting in place things that are good habits that you over time in a period of hopefully 60 or 90 days, like we always promote our, our weight loss program as a 90 day program. Now we, we say that because a lot of people are like, can I get results in 30 days? Absolutely. But what's your goal? If the goal is just to lose the weight, I think that we're doing you a disservice because what we should be doing here is we should be addressing your lifestyle. One, we want this to be a springboard in which you develop habits that become automatic to you in a 90 day period to where you start to consume good foods, you do ration your portion size. You don't need to eat as much. You start to, you know, think more deeply about what you're consuming and what you're doing and how active you're being. 
and the benefits that all those have to release such beautiful chemicals in the body that help with our, our energy levels, our happiness, like the mental and physical state of an individual are inseparable. They're tethered as one. You cannot, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but you cannot be truly deeply. And when I say deeply, I mean a, a very deep level of happiness. You can be happy, but have immense joy in your life is when you have good habits that you form that have become automatic, that display themselves both inwardly and outwardly in a way in which you feel and how you look. Now, I'm not suggesting that an individual Chad, needs to needs to get like super thin and be able to like, I'm not, I'm not going down that path. An individual to themselves needs to ask themselves the question, am I happy with who I am? Am I happy how I look? Am I happy with how I think? These are, these are personal things that nobody else can tell you. Now, there's motivational and inspirational individuals out there that can help guide you or give you good things that might help inspire you to take ownership of your life and make these difficult decisions to begin making good habits to replace the bad ones that then will become automatic in your life and become routine. So again, to answer your question in, in, in a very long way, but in short form is to say, guys, if you're listening to this podcast, a great book that I would actually invite you to go read is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he talks about the system in which an individual can develop a healthy habit that then becomes automatic after you have now put it into the brain, into the body, and you, you, it's, it, you've done it so many times that it is automatic. And, and I'll, t- I'll say this real quick as kind of a, a, a key point. I recognize this after I even read this book and I started to change some bad habits, both like procrastination is a bad habit, right? It has nothing to do necessarily with my physical health, but it can if I procrastinate not going to the gym or exercising or going outside and being active or finishing a task or a project that I've been given. And in order to overcome that habit, I had to buckle down, recognize one that I'm, I'm a terrible procrastinator. And this whole year, I've been working on having a to-do list, checking those, those boxes off, Anytime I have a thought, instead of just saying, oh, yeah, I'll do that, I write it down and I put it on my phone. And all of a sudden, now I have a system where today I had three thoughts come in. All of them went to the checklist and I've already checked all of them off this morning before this podcast. And I look at my checklist often and it stays very small. Some of these things are reoccurring and and changing, but I've really mitigated my procrastination and it's become very automatic to me that when I have a thought of something I need to do or that I commit to something or I tell somebody I'm going to do something, I then do it because I've created a system and a habit. Now, here's the proof. How long have you been trying to get me on your podcast? A long time. We've even had it scheduled. <laughs> and I'm the, ultimate, I'm the ultimate procrastinator for so long. And unfortunately, for so many years, I would just put it off, put it off. I'd, I'd commit to you. I'd say, Chad, I'm going to come on your podcast. And then I'd come up with some excuse or I'd have something or I'd prioritize something over this, right? And at the end of the day, it's not a matter of what's more important. It's what's important right now. Like looking in the future, it, it, you can do that. Everybody should be looking forward, but we have to be present and we have to live presently. And so these habits that I've had, like exercising and things in my life that haven't been a priority until I started a business that made it a priority, it's now become automatic. It's now become routine. So now I'm working both on my mental health, my physical health, and my spiritual health, because all those things are interconnected. So the more that individuals can take ownership of their lives, begin to recognize the bad habits that they have, and then recognize the things that they need to do that are incremental. And and you got to have these small wins over time, because that reinforces the belief that I can turn this into a successful and automatic habit. Those are what people need to do. How do we overcome obesity? Okay, a quick diet from Mountain Ops or any supplement company might change it for a few months. But if we haven't truly given you a routine or created a healthier alternative to your, your pre-existing lifestyle of, of being unhealthy, then we haven't, we haven't accomplished the mission because you're going to fall back into those, those routines and those bad habits unless you give yourself permission to make those changes incrementally, stay committed, and then watch how your body reacts. I love watching how people see when they cut sugars or they cut bread or they mitigate dairy and they, and they start to like minimize these things that it becomes overconsumption for them, how good they feel. Naturally, we haven't even put stimulant in the body at all, like, like caffeine to like try and, you know, like we talked about in, in part one. And all of a sudden, Chad, you start to see these people just begin to go, I don't crave 
the sugars. I don't crave the bread. I don't, I, I'll have a bunless burger. I, I, it still tastes just as good. Like my, my palate takes it in and, and it tastes good. I actually feel better because I don't feel so tired or sleepy because of all those carbs that I just in, it put into my body, you know? And it's like, it, it's kind of fascinating how when people actually exercise their right to give themselves permission to make significant changes, the results that then are compounded over time and how they begin to psychologically recognize not only how they feel from how they look, but mentally how they feel. And then what emits from that is just, they're happy, they're confident, and then they just want to go and do more and, 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 and be more happy and, and, and live a full life with no regret, right? Which I think is what all of us want. So again, very long answer no, to your question, No, it's a good one though. Chad, but what but in the talking? last podcast, you self-admittingly told me that you love Oreos and they have carbs and they have sugar and you, and I've yeah. been to pizza with you. I've seen you devour an 11 inch Mediterranean thin crust style personal pizza. So burgers, pizzas, Oreos are so, all but, on the So what are you saying, Jordan Harbison in a nutshell, real quick, correct me if I'm wrong, is that to get that confidence, to see a little bit of what that body can do. If you just cut all, you don't need to cut out all the bread, cut out some, you don't need to cut out every bit of sugar, cut out some, but let's say that you do take it to that area of I'm going carb free for a while to see how my body reacts. That doesn't necessarily mean that that person, once he or she sees their, her, her body or his body reacts, they might get to a point where, man, I've gotten here. I've been strength training. I've been doing cardio. I've been, you know, training for this half marathon or this 5k even or whatever right? Or I'm just going to try to run one lap around this track at my local high school. You might get to the point where you can enjoy a pizza again. You can get back to there. Or are you saying that you are so bionic, Jordan, that you can eat whatever you want and stay fit? I'm not going to buy that. I think you have to stay dedicated and committed to a plan and then reward yourself once in a while. Don't even call it cheating. You plan those meals out. You know you're going to eat them, and that's why you work so hard at the other part of your life to be able to reward your body once in a while with that type of meal. Is that correct? 100%. I mean, I, I, the, the number one that thing that I hear more often than not when people do the whole like cold turkey method is they're like, I tried it, but I just, I failed, right? It's like, it's like a smoker trying to stop smoking, right? They've developed an automatic like sequence in their body that like when they're stressed, like that actually tells me I need to, I need to smoke, right? Like when people like, it's, it's literally a habit or a bell that rings that they're like, okay, I need to, I need to smoke because like I'm stressed and this helps make me feel better when what they're putting in their body is not good. And it's, and over time, it's just going to deteriorate the interior of your body and, and make you a, not better off, right? I don't want to go too deep into that, but the same process is true with with eating habits. It's like you need to reward yourself. Okay. So, like, for instance, to your point, I always tell people, I'm like, I am not a professional dietitian. So I'm not certified to tell you anything. This is my own opinion, and you can take it or leave it. It doesn't hold any weight other than to my own personal experiences of which I've seen in my own life as I've done this, which is when I diet. What I do is I don't cut everything down. I say no to a few things like soda. I'm like, I can cut that out indefinitely. Like I, I know that the sugars and the carbonation really hold to my body. I really start to see a big belly with carbonation and with, with those sugars. And so, and, and when I drink too much soda, it's just, dude, I'll lose like 10 pounds just by cutting soda, period, and not changing anything else. But if I start to cut back and say, I'm going to have, I'm going to eat less sugar. I'm going to have less dairy. I'm going to eat. I, I'm strong enough for me personally that I can say I will have no bread. Like to start this thing, I'm, I'm going to say no to bread. So I'm going to go bunless and everything. If I have a pizza, I'm just going to scrape the cheese off and eat the cheese, but I won't have the, you know, and I'll, and I'll, I'll let some of these things go. But here's the truth. And what you're speaking about is it, everybody's different. And so everybody's got to pay close attention to themselves receive the, the professional help or the advice of those who are professional dietitians that can give you a plan that can help you to give you the runway you need to get started, but be mindful of rewarding yourself. I like how you said you're not cheating. Okay. Cheating mentally. Like if we say that psychologically, we'll look at that food and we'll look at it negatively. And we're like, I'm doing a bad thing today. It's not bad for you to have Oreos. It's not bad for you to have a slice of pizza. It's not bad for you to have a burger when you're dieting. If you're working hard on everything else and you want to reward yourself, 
But again, being mindful of, I'm not going to eat an entire pizza, right? I'm going to have a slice of pizza because I love the taste of that. And I'm going to reward myself because I just did a two a day or whether I did cardio in the morning and a workout in the afternoon, like I burned a lot of calories. I'm going to reintroduce some, but I've earned it. And this is a reward. And I like how you said the word reward because the way in which you develop a healthy habit is a process in which incrementally over time, you have a lot of wins. When you keep winning, the way I, I created my checklist and to do every day, dude, checking off that box and seeing that, that, that task accomplished, I felt this endorphin release of like, I accomplished something, like I'm succeeding, I'm winning. And winning is so important when developing healthy habits because they will become automatic to the point where you're always winning. Now, are you going to make mistakes? Yes. But I think to your point, I'm just saying, guys, when you're looking at your diet plans, when you're looking at all these things, find out what works best for you and listen to your body because you are you know, the steward of your body. No one else is. Have a sense of accountability. It's good to have somebody else because they can make you accountable. Sometimes we are not strong enough to develop habits ourselves and we need others' help, right? And so I always strongly encourage to like the buddy system or to have somebody there to be accountable. But again, going just back to your point of like, no, I, I reward myself at night with Oreos because I've exercised, I, I ate good. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm going to have Oreos. And then Jordan and I, we will, my wife and I will go get a uh, pizza, you know, or we'll go get a burger. Like I love burgers. I eat them all the time. But here's the thing I've created in my life balance to where I'm able to manage my weight at, at, because I'm, I'm counteracting all of these things that could be bad for me with so much good that I can have and reward myself with food that isn't nutritious. I would say highly nutritious or very good for you if you're going to macros and going to all the nutrients, but I enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And don't penalize yourself or, or feel that you can't, because I think Chad, you and I both know this. There are people out there that will go to extremes in diet. Well, they'll deplete themselves to the point where you're like, you don't, you, you're very skinny, but you don't look healthy. You look like you're going to blow over in the and wind. You can't be, ha you can't and, be and happy that, like that. You can't, again, there's two sides where I was thinking, Jordan, while you're talking, I don't mean to interrupt you. Is like, then you take this, then you take the mental part of what you're saying, where you started 20 minutes ago with happiness and how I look at people. I'm like, can you be happy being, whether it's a cup, a hundred pounds overweight, are you in pain every day? Psychologically, when you're looking in the mirror and vanity, vanity to me is important. I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it. I look in the mirror and see myself on TV or see myself on a video and I automatically go to critique it myself. I am 100% guilty of being the ultimate critic, which is in a lot of ways, I've heard it from Tony Robbins all the way down to a lot of different classes I've taken in the motivational world that I'm way too critical. So my, my point to you, Jordan Harbinson is as you transition into this quote unquote happy person or happy version of yourself, you have to understand that when you look at somebody like Jordan Harbinson or Chad Mendez, they're not trying to tell you that, Hey, I got in shape and I'm happy all the time because it's like a give and take. We are, we still have peaks and valleys. You still go through depressions and downfalls and sad, sad times. My only point, Jordan, was instead of being pain, pain, in pain all the time and unhappy with the way I look, I'd rather get to a point to where now I'm unhappy if I miss a day at the gym. I'm unhappy if I didn't challenge myself that day. Now I'm unhappy for different reasons, which benefits me in the long run. I'm not, I'm not yes. unhappy. I'm not unhappy because I look bad. I'm unhappy because I cheated myself today out of a workout. I procrastinated. Yes. And that's, that's that transition of unhappiness for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons to the right reasons. And that's what working out in a healthy lifestyle can do to your brain and your psyche in a hurry. Once you start seeing results, you start to go, I'm not going to miss it. And now I'm not going to feel bad if I have a piece of round table pizza. I'm going to go have one right now because I earned it. I, I'm rewarding myself because I don't have to cut it all out. There's that, that's a tricky thing of unhappiness. Everybody is going to transition that way in one way or the other when they're inside their psyche, if that makes sense. Dude, perfectly said. And I agree 100% with what you're saying. And one of the things that's actually helped me as I try to explain this to people is is how people, the word happy or happiness can be so defined so differently from everyone else, like to person to person, like what makes them happy or, or what brings them happiness or what makes them unhappy? You know, 
the thing that, that I always try to help people see, and this is something that I actually just learned recently this year, was, and I never in, in my 33 years of life have really deeply understood this the way I now understand it, which is the difference between happiness and joy. And so I want to explain that real quickly because I think it plays right into what you're saying. I think, I think we can be happy, but we may not, our happiness, we, not, we might not be placing our happiness in the right places for things that will br- truly bring us joy. And so what that means is like you just spoke to earlier, like, when you don't go to the gym, you, you don't, you feel guilty because you cheated yourself of doing something good for you. Because when you do it, you feel good and you were able to do good. And there's, there's a, a psychological transition there when we take a bad habit and we replace it with good habits that now when it becomes automatic for us and we don't do it, our psyche says, just like a, like if, if we don't, you know, I, I, I hate that I keep using this analogy, but yeah, like, when, when you get stressed, instead of grabbing a cigarette and saying, I'm going to smoke away my stress, right? You say, I'm going to go lift weights at the gym, right? It's like, does both accomplish the same thing? Yes. When I smoke, I de-stress. I feel less stressed than I was before I had the cigarette. Now, guys, I don't smoke, but I hate that I'm using this example, but I know a lot of smokers that do this and, and smoking, you should, I wouldn't recommend that you do it at all, but because it's not a good habit. Now, did we accomplish the goal? Yes. By smoking, I, I psychologically was able to de-stress and be like, okay, I feel good. But inside, I just talk like so many toxins just entered my body. I'm burning my lungs. It's not healthy. You can't, you can't tell me it is. But to, to Chad's point, when I feel stressed, I go and I work out my stress in the gym. I pump a little bit more weight. I exert myself more and I, and I work myself out to the point where when I'm done, I feel so good and I feel so de-stressed and I feel, I feel good. Cause to your point, you, all these emotions that we're going to feel that come in ebbs and flows, whether it's happiness, sadness, you know, peaks, valleys, like you're speaking about trying to normalize that ha- comes with creating and having good habits that are automatic to where you can take those peaks and those valleys, you know, those ups and downs, and you can normalize that to be less abrasive, like less dramatic, right? You're more consistent. Consistency in your life will create more happiness, will create more success. So the thing, again, going back to happiness and joy is the difference between the two that I want everybody in this podcast to recognize that I've learned is, is happiness is an emotion in which we experience feelings ranging from contentment and satisfaction um, to bliss or an intense pleasure. Okay. Whereas joy is a stronger, less common feeling than happiness. We experience joy um, when we achieve selflessness to the point of personal sacrifice. And what I mean by that is like, when you accomplish something, like whether it's overcoming an obstacle in your life, if it's, if it's weight, if it's depression, if it's whatever that obstacle might be, when you overcome that and you've learned how to, to, to you know, right size that part of your life, you can be happy through the journey, but when you've accomplished that and you now know I'm going to be a happy person, I'm not going to be a depressed person anymore because this is what I'm going to do to overcome that. And you actually do those things. You will have immense joy, which is long lasting and consistent. Happiness comes in, in waves. That's why people will take hits of sugar to, to feel good. You know, unfortunately people will look at bad images on the internet to feel good. Like there's, there's always people feel pain, pleasure, and, and it's all happiness, unhappy. But joy, joy is something that's consistent. It's evergreen. As long as you overcome the obstacles that are in your way to create those healthy, consistent habits that become automatic in your life so that you can then begin to experience joy. And then we always say, mountain ops, you can't give what you don't have, right? So it, it's hard for you to impart your, your, your happiness if you're not truly happy. But if you have joy then it's, it's, it's very easy and, and natural for you to want to give that to someone else and help them find the joy that you've found. Right. Does that make 100%, sense? Chad? And I think that, I think that it's, this is, you know, this part two of this podcast, we have 15 minutes left because we, we both talk in a good way, a, a, a lot, lot, but in a good way, because I get a lot out of what you're saying. And when you're talking right there in the last three or four minutes, Jordan Harbison, I start thinking of, 
what I like to consider these words, and they're not my words, but I want you to speak on this. Um, and we can take the last 15 minutes. We are going to come back without procrastination for part three, because I still want to talk about the workout part of mountain ops with, with, I want to, I want to revisit Yeti. I want to talk about what, you know, branch chains, amino acids and BCAAs are. I want to talk about Magnum and ammo and the protein supplements, the meal replacement, all of the things that's going on on that part of the business, um, in the brand. I really do want to get into that because that instruction is huge to our listeners, but one of my favorite singers in the world is out of the state of Kentucky, and he's not a real famous guy. He should be. He is one of the best songwriters ever. His name's Chris Knight. If you've never listened to him, Jordan, please do yourself a favor and go download all of Chris Knight's albums today and listen to the words. He's got a new song on his new album. It's called Almost Daylight, the album is. It's Grammy nominated this year, and the song is called Send It On Down with Leanne Womack, and it's about, just listen to it, please, today, Jordan, and text me what you feel when you listen to the lyrics. So, his album, this is my- Chris Knight, K N I G H T. Little uh, his his little perfect his his album before this, and these are the words I'm speaking of that you keep reminding me of when you talk. Little victories. Now, if you as a human being understand what the meaning of a little victory is, when I go into my and, and a line in Chris's song "Little Victories" is he says, "I got a deer and a half in the freezer." When I open my freezer door or oh, the chest freezer or the regular freezer and I see wild game that I know what it took to get it in there, it's a little victory. I don't have to go out and win a thirty a, a twenty six mile marathon to have a victory. And what you said with procrastination in this to do list, I learned this a long time ago in college, is that I will write down things like this, Jordan. Take a shower get fuel. I'm not saying that I forget to shower. I'm saying that the endorphins that are released into my body, when I cross that off and get fuel, feed the dog, swing my daughter, whatever it is, these little victories, they create what you, what becomes what you're talking about now with cigarette smoking and addiction. I get addicted to just the littlest tiny victories in the world where I could look at my trophy wall at my mom's house of our college athletic, you know, when we were the, you know, the letterman jacket wear and we were something, you know, when we were really winning trophies, these little victories now are what drive me in a world of that everybody's happy. Everybody's living their best life. All you got to do is go onto Instagram right now and everybody's going to have a smile and it's a perfect day. It's hard to imagine a life with sadness unless you're living a real life. And when you start talking about needing to reach for a cigarette, I reach for a little victory. So these endorphins that are released, knowing that I got to talk to my friend Jordan today, I get to go practice my duck call, I get to go train my dog Axel, I get to talk to people in the business world and maybe even land a deal. But because of these little victories, now I can take it a step further and say, all right, I'm going to try to download a push-up app on my phone. And I'm just going to start with six push-ups today. And every three days a week, it's going to elevate me to where at the end of this six-week deal, I'm going to try to do 100 in one day. You think about that. You think about just those small challenges and what I call little victories now. And I listen to Chris Knight sing about them. The song Little Victories is a duo with John Prine. Rest in peace, Mr. Prine. If you listen to the words, Jordan, it's going, you're going to sit there and go, we just did a whole podcast on little victories. That's all it takes is a little tiny victory a day to bring us back. And then you're going to form an addiction. And instead of reaching for that cigarette, you're going to reach for that dumbbell. You're going to reach for that green button on a, on a Stairmaster or, or a Versa climber that's going to challenge yourself every day of like, that's the endorphins I need, these little victories. Hopefully that makes sense. And I'll let you talk for the last 10 minutes, Jordan. But little victories to me and what you're talking about, procrastination and crossing these little to-dos off every day are not just things that need to be done. They're little victories. Look at everything as a little victory because at the end of the day, you're going to look at yourself and go, I won today. I won. And that's all you need to keep going. hundred percent. I, I love how you said, you know, and, and I've seen this so much in my own life. And I, and I know that you just expressed, you re, you can relate to this, which is, you know, we, we as human beings, we need little victories. And I think so often in life, people sometimes, especially in our world today, because of social media, and and I'll relate this in in two ways, two industries, right? Sports and hunting. So in in hunting, you'll see a guy that, that, you know, gets this big animal or he gets this really mature elk 
And unfortunately, sometimes people will degrade that and say, oh, he got it because of this. And they'll say that. And, and, or they'll be very happy for him. And they'll be like, man, he, I mean, I wish I could do that, right? I wish I could get that elk or I could get that deer. And I could be able to accomplish something so amazing like what you just accomplished, right? And all they see, okay, Chad, all they see is, a, is an Instagram photo and, and maybe a small some context behind it of, of the year that they got them or the area or whatever they're willing to share. What they don't see, right, is the tip of the iceberg. Like when you look at the iceberg, we, they always say the tip of the iceberg. That's all they see. But underneath all that was an individual who hopefully was training hard, who if it's an archer, was shooting his bow often and practicing his trade. If it's a rifle hunter, he was going to the range and making sure his equipment was on and he was feeling comfortable and confident at certain ranges in order to do that. And, and then they were going out often if they're a more experienced seasoned hunter and they were putting themselves in areas and environments that they knew that game would be at. And they studied the area or maybe they scouted and they put trail cameras and they, and they did all this work, but yet only what the individual on the end saw when it all came to the end is, you know, they got this big buck or they got this big bowl. And the same is true in sports. We see these teams that they, they get these championships and, and they win the trophy at the end. And everyone's like, Oh my gosh, I wish I can win the, the trophy and I could be a champion and so on and so forth. And, and so often in our culture today, we forget about all the little things, all the little victories that they, they had, they won more than anybody else. That's why they're champion, right? They won the most, but did they lose some unless they're a completely undefeated team? Then yeah, they had some losses, but every game they play, Every practice they practice at is in preparation to get to that championship, but they can't, you can't look that far ahead because you have to remember what's in front of you right now. What's most important right now, be present with a mind set on the future and the goal that you have, but the little victories, the small wins every day that you can have are going to compound. We talk about the compounding effect or the compounding interest for self-development or self-improvement comes at at a minimum of 1%. We all, Chad, want to be 100% in our lives. However, it is going, if you will just become 1% better at writing a to-do list or eating better or exercising, and every day you only increase your effort by 1%, one year from the day that you decide to do that, 100 days later, you will be 100% better at whatever it was that you applied this principle to of small victories and small wins and overcoming bad addictions. Like you said, like I, I, I keep, I keep using smoking because it's it is, it's a, it's a terrible addiction. And we have many addictions in our lives and, and people can argue and say that sugar is, is just as bad as drugs. And I'm not going to say you're, you're wrong. I, I, I'm no, I'm an addict to sugar. I love sugar. You know, and I try and control my, my addiction to it or my, my bad habit with it as best as I can. But I also, you know, I, I have it and, 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 and it feels good when I eat a, a chocolate Milky Way or, or when I have a donut or what. We all understand that, you know, unlike my brother Casey, who like you can't get him if it's salt. My brother's addicted to salt. He hates sugar. He's like, I, I never understood it growing up because I'd be like, you want to go get some dessert? He's like, no, let's go get some French fries. And I'm like, what? You know, but like everybody has a vice or everybody can have something that, that can become so much that if you, if it becomes a vice or it becomes addict, an addiction, it can be bad. But like you said earlier, you can replace those bad addictions with healthy ones, with good ones. You can take bad habits and you can make them into good habits by replacing things that will then eventually over time through a compounding effort of an increase of a minimum of 1% effort to that thing, you will make it automatic and you will become a champion. champion. That. And I, will- that is such an important word because there's so many different parts of champion and to be a champion in life. If you think about it, Jordan, I'm gonna let you finish your thought. When you go to that, what you called the championship and the tip of the iceberg and Tom Brady's holding up that trophy again, 
There was also another team that was considered for that championship in that same 60 minutes. And then you see their fans crying and you see their, their linebacker hanging his head or the center fielder moping off the field because they just lost the World Series and the Dodgers just won it when Tampa Bay was that close. In wrestling, somebody's got to lose for Jordan Burroughs to be the champion. The Iron Sheik had to lose for Hulk Hogan to be the champion so many of those great matches in WWE. My point is, little victories... Even those champions that win today go home and say, all right, we need to improve here. There's, it's a never-ending game. It's a never-ending. So when Chad Mendez flexes his abs and you see him being Chad Mendez, understand that he goes home and goes, wait a minute. I got to improve here. My archery shots off a little bit. Maybe my abs are too strong and I'm breathing too heavy. There's all kinds of things. Those guys that are right there on the er, the verge of victory that were 14 and one and they lost to Tom Brady and the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl, they were right there that close to be considered the champion. They got to go home and say, what can we do to be the champion? The champions go home and got it. They have to go, well, what do we got to do to become the champion again or stay the champion? It's a never ending process. So stop looking for instant gratification. Stop thinking that you have to be addicted to something to take over a part of your body to fix something. You don't have to be. Look for those little victories and then call me and say, oh my God. I feel like I'm accomplishing something in every single part of my day that when you do put your phone down at six o'clock, hopefully to have a quiet dinner with your family, you can sit there and feel those endorphins released as you put that corn on the cob into your mouth and say, today was a great day. Today was an accomplished day. I accomplished this, this, and this. I might not have won the championship, but I, I have this many little victories to build on tomorrow. I think that's what we're trying to say in the last 60 minutes. Truly. I, I and I love the way that you just put that. Cause that's what I was going to say was, so let's talk about the people who won those championships. What do they do next? Well, they go back to work, right? In the sports world, they go back to, okay, we gotta, I'm, I'm going to become even better to protect this title that we just won as a team, right? Because in sports, unless it's a tennis player or it's an individual sport, we tend to, in, in, in sports, look at ourselves as teams, right? And, and I think that's really important for people to recognize something. You don't ever accomplish anything in your life on your own. And, and what I mean by that is, at some point in your life, and hopefully you have these people or you have this mindset, someone was always there or someone is cheering you on. Whether they're a cheerleader, whether they're a teammate, there is somebody that wants you to be better. And whether it's your father in heaven who is always there when you are willing to give him the time and notice him and, 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 and lean into him and our savior, these are, these are, you, 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 you have never accomplished anything alone. I want people to walk away from this podcast and recognize that, that you don't have to go this journey alone. And these, these small victories that you can have daily are ones that you want to not only share within yourself, but share with others. Because as a team, in order to win a championship, it's going to take all this practice. It's going to take all this hard work, all this sacrifice. And you're going to, you're going to have to sacrifice a lot in order to get to what you want to be. But again, like we talked about earlier with happiness and joy, joy is when you have been selfless. It's when you have sacrificed something greatly and then you've accomplished something so, so much that you want to give it to somebody else. You don't want to hold it for your own and, and be selfish. You want to be selfless. And so remember that, that life is nothing more than a day and a game every day that we get to play. And every day we're practicing for the greatest of all championships, which is to go home to our father in heaven eventually and be with all those people we love and live forever in pure joy and happiness because of all that we did every day in this life to be good people and to do better and to help others. And so just because you win a championship, that doesn't mean like, Oh, I like, I'm good. I did it. It's like, no, that's not what life is all about. Yeah. Work towards that goal, but have another goal ready to work towards next. And life is all about that, continuing to move the ball down the field and continuing to progress and be better and to do better. And then as you can, and most importantly of all, and again, this is our biggest belief in Mount Ops, the more that you help yourself, okay, the more that you'll be able to help Mentorship, others. big and time. There's nothing more important than that because, again, you can't give what you don't have. But as you, you do what we've talked about on the podcast today, and, and, and I'm somebody that's trying to do this every day. I know, Chad, you talk to, this is something that you're doing every day. Every day, we're trying to have small victories, to have wins. Every day, we're at practice. Every day, we're trying to better ourselves. 
And every opportunity that we can get to do that is another opportunity to look outside ourselves and see what can I do today to help somebody else? Because in return, I promise you, by helping out somebody else, you in return help yourself. 100%. And it's this beautiful symbiotic and, and concert uh, process of, of, of just a, a total circle of pure joy. When you can see the life of another become better because you are good enough to be able to help them. Now, the last thing that I want to say is this, just because I, I think the strongest people in life and some of the people that I admire the most are the people who, when they were going through the toughest times of their lives, the most trivial times, the most, most obstacles that are in their way or their path, they still leaned out and helped others who maybe weren't as, di- in, in their pers- mind, wasn't going as tough as time as them, but they had the ability or the know-how to say, hey, I know my day is really tough or I'm having a hard time, but I'm going to help this person out because they look like they need some help. And I, I can only say to you, everyone on this podcast, those are the strongest people because you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to be 100% happy. There's always going to be something. Or, or, and, and we never know what somebody's going through. But just remember, be mindful of others, help others. And in return, you'll help yourself. But as you work day in and day out to better oneself, you will truly find more happiness and then you'll have a consistent overlay overlay of joy as you as you sacrifice and you accomplish and you have those little victories every day. So that'll kind of I think hopefully segue us into part three, where we will talk more deeply about the the recovery side of we talked earlier about some of the pre's and, and getting going. Now we're kind of talking about your mental state. And now we're gonna go flip back to your your physical state and some of the products and things that Mount Ops has that can help you to stay the course. Yes. And, and right? we'll, yes, I love that. We'll transition on part three with Jordan Harbison into what he just touched on in the words mentorship, which is so important as we mature into our life of getting new people involved in whether it's the outdoors or athletics or church or any of the things that you are being um, a part of in your daily life, you are going to find so much value and reward and mentorship. I can't tell you what it meant to grow up with a father that had us in the woods and the outdoors because we took it for granted almost. And you look at people now that grew up in the city that have never held a gun or a bow and arrow or been on a hunt or on a mountaintop or heard an elk bugle or a coyote owl or a goose honk or a duck quack. I look at it like, man, that's crazy to me, but it was all because of mentorship. So we'll start there next time, Jordan Harbison. We will get in to the recovery, the workout part, the ammo, the Magnum, the BCAAs, all of the great products that Mountain Ops offers. Mountain Ops is a supplement company, but it's more than that. It's a community and a culture. And hopefully you guys are getting something out of our talks here with the founder, the co-founder, the co-owner, Jordan Harbertson. Jordan, thank you very much. I will get in touch with you for part three soon, my man. That was good, Chad. As always, thank you for having me. I I love having you on. But I am going to put you on the spot real quick because I went online to order some Mountain Ops today. And talking to the owner, and you can say no if you want. Can you hook me up and find me some pumpkin spice or eggnog? Because it says that it's all out of inventory. Can you just find a little bit, oh, please, for me? Isn't that so sad? We we last year when we released, well, two years ago, I think it was actually two or three years, we did the pumpkin spice. Super successful. Then we launched eggnog and we launched like a candy cane and a peppermint chocolate. And we did all these seasonal holiday flavors. And man, we, we did not load in enough this year. And I, I, in fact, in some of these flavors, we didn't even bring back, unfortunately, because we were, you know, this year was crazy with all the things that have happened, but the overwhelming uh, re- reply of people like you, they're like, dude, give me some pumpkin spice. Like I need it during this time of year. You know what I mean? Like that's my jam. Like these is the I like pumpkin. I love peppermint. I love egg. Like dude, eggnog oh, I for love me. It. I, I, I drink it by the gallon. So when we made ammo eggnog and I put that with milk and I mixed that together, dude, I, I never went to the store and bought like real eggnog, yeah. if you will. And dude, I, I forgot the same 
feeling in love for eggnog that I personally have with our product. I know we're all out. I'll Come on, please. Just, just, just text me and say something's on the way. That's Jordan Harvidson. We will be back with another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast. Thank you all so much for supporting the partners and sponsors that support us. Gerber Gear, Mountain Ops, Tom, hit that button. This is Leith Loft, and the song is called What You Gonna Do When The Money's All Gone. So fitting to our conversation. Thank you guys so much for the support. Y'all take care. Life on earth